Good morning, good morning. We're going to be reading from the book of Luke, chapter 8, 40 to 56. On the other side of the lake, the crowds welcomed Jesus because they had been waiting for him. Then a man named Jairus, a leader of the local synagogue, came and fell at Jesus' feet, pleading him with him to come home with him. His only daughter, who was about 12 years old, was dying. As Jesus went with him, he was surrounded by the crowds. A woman in the crowd had suffered for 12 years with constant bleeding, and she could find no cure. Coming up behind Jesus, she touched the fringe of his robe immediately. The bleeding stopped. Who touched me? Jesus asked. Everyone denied it. And Peter said, Master, this whole crowd is pressing up against you. But Jesus said, Someone deliberately touched me, for I felt the healing power go out from me. When the woman realized that she could not stay hidden, she began to tremble and fell to her knees in front of him. The whole crowd heard her explain why she had touched him and that she had been immediately healed. Daughter, he said to her, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. While he was still speaking to her, a messenger arrived from the home of Jairus, the leader of the synagogue. He told him, your daughter is dead. There's no use troubling the teacher now. But when Jesus heard what had happened, he said to Jairus, don't be afraid. Just have faith and she will be healed. When they arrived at the house, Jesus wouldn't let anyone go in with him except Peter, John, James, and the little girl's father and mother. The house was filled with people wearing or weeping and wailing, but he said, stop the weeping. She isn't dead. She's only sleeping. But the crowd laughed at him because they all knew she had died. Then Jesus took her by the hand and said in a loud voice, my child, get up. And at that moment, her life returned, and she immediately stood up. Then Jesus told them to give her something to eat. Her parents were overwhelmed, but Jesus insisted that they not tell anyone what had happened. Anybody else feel the Holy Spirit moving today? Amen. Is it okay if I pray today? Let's do some prayer. Heavenly Father, we, wow, we humble ourselves in your greatness, Lord. You are a good, good father, Lord. And we ask today that those who need that increase in faith, that you pour that spirit into them today, Lord, as you have poured it into me this morning, Lord. We ask that our faith increase so that we can give faith to others to come seek you and find you, Lord. And, Lord, I ask, I ask blessings upon those who are under my voice, Lord, that need that blessing today, Lord, or this week, Lord. And we pray into Pastor Sean today that his word reaches our ears and our hearts in a way that we can only imagine that you give it to us. And we pray all this in your holy name. Amen. Amen and amen. Got something to say, church? God is good. And all the time. Oh, yeah, God is good today. Yes, he is good. The weather's nice outside. The sanctuary's not freezing today. Um, we, we don't have a plumbing issue that we thought we did. Today, God is good. Every day, God is good. Some days, we recognize it more than other days, and we're a little more excited to worship and cheer. Some days, we aren't so aware of God's goodness, and we're a little bit more sad or grumpy when we get up. You know, my, my son, Griffin, he asked me about generations the other day. Um, yesterday when we were hanging out and I was trying to explain to him generations. He asked what generation he was from, what generation I was from, and what generation the grandparents were from. And he's trying to get the names down, the greatest generation, the silent generation, the baby boomer generation, you know, generation X, the awesomest generation, right? And the rest of them. And he goes through it and he gets to him. He goes, oh, so I'm alpha. I said, yes, you are generation alpha. He's very excited about that. And he said, you know, I figured out what the older generations are versus the younger generations. I said, what? He says, the older generations, you can always tell who they are. I said, how do you, how do you know? He says, because they're grumpy. 
They're tired. Yes, you see, we cannot, we cannot portray ourselves to our children that every day God isn't good and we know it, church. Amen? Amen. Yeah, I'm so thankful this morning for our worship team. I'm thankful for Chris and Josh and Jared getting up here and sharing their passion with you for Christ, sharing their passion for ministry. Um, yesterday was, I mean yesterday, last week was a special service. We'll talk about that uh, maybe as we go throughout today's service. It was a special moment with Pastor Terry coming here, and it was a different type of service. And I know that there were people who came to that service who normally don't attend Kingsway. And there may have even been people, I believe at least one or two, who came to Kingsway for the first time ever um, last week. Um, and that's, that was great. That was interesting, I'm sure, for them. Sometimes it was for the first time I ever saw anybody last week um, at that service. And it occurred to me today that when you come to church for the first time, that's a big deal. And I am surprised to see Nick and Adriana here today, which means that their baby girl, Isabella, yeah? Isabella, this is her first time at Kingsway Christian Center, first time at church. Amen. 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 Yes, that makes today special. That reminds me that God is good. Regardless of what's going on in your life today, what's going on at work today, what's going on in your finances or in your health today, I hope today you are reminded of how good God is. God has sent an angel from heaven down to this planet. They named her Isabella and put her in the care of Nick and Adriana. I encourage you to pray for them, encourage them, and I encourage you to look in your own life for the blessings that God has given you because there are many Many, many more blessings in our life, many more things to be thankful for than to complain about. Amen? Amen. So as you have picked up what we're putting down, we have started a new series, Death to Life. This is the series that is going to extend from our previous series on faith. We talked about faith and what it means to have faith in this world, what it means to have a, a belief system. How do we use faith in our everyday life and, and how do we increase our faith and and how do we leverage our faith? And now we're going to talk about specific individuals in the Bible, specific individuals in our life uh, where we can see faith being manifest, faith being leveraged. And here, I'm going to tell you straight up, I'm going to tell you from the bottom line, up front, from the very beginning, life ain't easy. Life is hard. And some of the best stories of faith come from a time of struggle, tragedy, difficulty, unforeseen circumstances all throughout the Bible. Times even in Scripture where you will see in the examples that we'll be carrying out in these next few weeks where people's lives are literally at the brink of death or maybe even dead. Yeah, people die in the Bible. Or in other situations where their life feels like it ain't worth living. And yet God was able to take that mess, if you will, and turn it into something awesome. We call it as pastors, taking your mess and turning it into a message. And that is what this series is about. And it will carry this series all the way through Easter. Um, and the series will follow different people in the Bible who had this experience from death to life. Um, today, we are studying Luke chapter 8. Uh, this is the reading that Jared just read about Jairus. Did I say it right? Jairus. Um, I always thought it was Jairus. And I thought it would be appropriate for Jared to do the reading. But apparently it's Jairus. And Jared did a great job. Thank you, Josh. That's a lot of J's. Yes. Um, this series we've been working on for quite some time. Planning it. And beginning of this year, we brought on a new pastor. And she's helping us plan things and get ahead of the game. And we've been planning the faith series and then planning this series. And we knew Terry was coming. And we knew we needed to bookend that with some things. And we decided this was going to be a great way to bookend what Terry was ministry going all the way through Easter. And as we put those together, we started preparing um, what people in the Bible we're going to focus on. As different pastors are going to share um, what God has spoken to them. And for me, I got an opportunity um, to kick it off. Of course, I'm going to let you on a secret. I'm preaching on Easter. I'm going to preach about Jesus. Um, so I had to come up with something, ask the Lord for something um, about this death to life 
before Jesus actually died. And so, of course, what came to mind was one of the few instances, and there's a few in Scripture, three in fact, where Jesus was walking around and somebody literally died. I figured that would be a great example. Lazarus is a very popular one. And there's two other people who've died in Scripture. One of them is J- Jairus's daughter. And so I was gravitating to the Scripture. And I was working on it, thinking about it. wasn't sure if that's really what the Lord wanted me to do. And then it happened. Uh, again, I talk about it many, many times. If you have not exposed yourself to the chosen, you are lacking in 2023. I frankly believe it's the best content on television, bar none. And I got Netflix, Disney+, Plus, Apple TV. I just got Peacock and I think Paramount. By the way, all that cost me about $22 a month compared to cable. That's not bad. Um, so if you have cable, consider cutting the cord and going with the service. And Angel Studios, they publish The Chosen, and it's free. Not even a single penny. And if you logged on to The Chosen and you've been watching the new season, which is The Life of Jesus, we're in season three. Uh, they just released an episode um, that I just caught up with, episode five. And episode five on The Chosen was this exact passage in Scripture. I put the QR code up there so you can take a picture of it. That way, if you're not watching Chosen, take a picture of the screen or go back and watch it on Facebook. That picture will create a link. You can click that link and it will bring up the Chosen episode right on your phone. No cost to you. And it will change your life. I don't just mean the series. I mean literally every episode will change your life. And here's news. There's nothing new under the sun. You'll watch the episode. You will hear nothing new. You will... You will understand something on a totally different level. It's just the Bible. And they share the story of Jesus. And I know it. And I've heard it. And I've preached it. But this time, I don't know what's going on with God's anointing. But whatever he's doing with these actors, with this studio, it is amazing. I don't have time to talk too much more about that. And Chris and I, we discussed maybe doing a whole series on The Chosen and what it means to our generation. Um... But right now, I just want to point out that if you want to accentuate today's sermon, go and watch this episode. Even if you just watch one episode, watch this. It is different. Today is different. Um, Today, as I go through this series um, and this sermon today, I'm going to use scripture. Of course, I'm going to, I've already read you the scriptures. I'm going to go through and tell you what God is speaking to me. But today, in the slides, I'm actually going to use screen clips from the movie. Um, they're not real bright and that's on purpose. You have to really squint to see them and that's on purpose because if you see something you like, then maybe you'll be interested to actually go watch the episode. Um, so that's why I'm not showing clips because I really want you to get into it. All right, with that said, I want to bring up some of the verses that he was uh, reading to us. Luke chapter 8, verse 43. As Jesus went with him, Jairus, he was surrounded by the crowds. Jesus was surrounded by Lots and lots of people in a small alleyway as he's walking through the towns. The town he in wasn't very big. Um, and so as he's walking, he's surrounded by all these people because Jesus was famous at that time. He had done miracles and he was teaching great wisdom and people wanted to be around him. They just wanted to be around famous celebrity like Jesus. So they, they came and they wanted to hear what he had to say and see what he was going to do. They were curious. They didn't have social media. They didn't have videos and memes back then. They wanted the real thing. So they chased the man down and there he was in the middle of the crowd. And it says, a woman in the crowd, and this is all it says, and it has it in in three of the Gospels. It doesn't have much about the woman. It doesn't say her name or where she came from. There is a backstory to the woman. It's in Bible history, and they actually bring the backstory out in The Chosen. So if you want to see it, you can see it there. But here it just says in 43, a woman in the crowd had suffered, say suffered, for 12 years. I don't care what you're suffering with. If you're suffering with something for 12 years, that is suffering. Not only suffering with just maybe a a mental illness or a situation or a tragedy or a circumstance in your life, but suffering from a health issue is very painful. In her situation, says she was suffering from constant bleeding. And she could find no cure. It doesn't take much imagination to understand how this life was, this woman was living her life and how difficult it was for her. The Bible says in the King James Version, um, specifically, instead of had no cure, she spent all her money looking for a cure. Went to all the doctors, got all the exams, couldn't find anything. 
that was wrong with her. Couldn't find any way to stop the bleeding. Constantly for 12 years, she's tired. Constantly for 12 years, she's in pain. Not once a month, 12 years. And because of that, you can imagine her life situation. Well, first she went to the doctors. That costs money. Year one, year two, year three. I'm sure sometime in that first decade, she ran out of money, which means she was broke. And she's still bleeding. From there, she's trying to figure out how to live her life. And you see, in the scriptures, they teach back then, in Jewish tradition, back then, when you were bleeding of any sort, you were, quote, unclean, which means you couldn't touch anyone. Not your children, not your spouse, and certainly not a religious leader. And if you did, like a doctor, they had to go through a, a ritual, a ceremony to cleanse themselves, which means they charged more money because you were a pain in the butt. That was a situation this one was living in. Doctor to doctor, spending the money, can't figure it out, ultimately becoming homeless. Because no one wanted to be around her, not in her family, not in her friend circle, nowhere. She wasn't married. She didn't have children. And on top of that, more than likely, as history would teach us, her own family probably disowned her because they couldn't be around her. Broke, homeless, sick, unclean. Meaning she couldn't be a part of society. Hard to earn wages, hard to take care of herself, hard to provide. She lived a very difficult life. And it's hard as a pastor to preach what she's going through, particularly as a male pastor, uh, if you want to get a better sense on what this woman was going through, watch the chosen. <clears throat> anyway, 12 years, constant bleeding. She couldn't find a cure, cure. So on verse 44, it says, she came up behind Jesus, touching the fringe of his robe. And immediately the bleeding stopped. 12 years, no answer. She comes in contact with the one true living God, and immediately everything changes. Heavenly Father, Lord God, we have become a praying church. For your word says, can the house of God be a house of prayer? Father, so that is what we want to be good at. We don't want to be the best preachers or the best worship leaders or the best content developers. We don't want to have the best building or the best lighting or the best sound or the best carpets or the best children ministries or the best youth ministries or the best food drive ministries. Lord, we want to do your will here on earth, whatever it may be, and we will do those things to the best of our ability. But Lord God, if we can be great at something, let us be great at prayer, for that is what you've called us to. May we worship you in our prayer. May we serve you in our prayer. And may our prayer change things. And so, Father God, I pray today that you would speak to us about this woman, Jairus, and his daughter. In the precious name of Jesus. And everybody says, Amen. You see, this woman was desperate. She's in a crowd of lots of people. For her to go to that crowd and be unclean, if she was determined, she could have been stoned to death right in public. Of course, there was going to be men there. Of course, there was going to be other people there. And if she was identified, I imagine it would have been very difficult for her to get out of trouble. And yet she went to the town. She went to the crowd just so she could get a touch of Jesus. Not even a conversation. The Bible says she just wanted to touch the hem of his garment. Well, what do I have to say about this today? When we realize that there are things in our lives that are killing us, when we realize that we're at a point of death, we become pretty desperate. And I tell you this, and I wish you could hear me today. I, if you have ears, listen. If you have eyes, open them. There are so many ways that people will tell you about how you need to do church or how you need to do worship or how you need to read the Bible or how you need to dress or how you need to talk or how you need to think or how you need to pray. I'm telling you, we do not need to worry about the correct way to reach out to God. Are you with me, church? If yes, say amen. Okay, somebody's with me. She had absolutely nothing to lose. 
She quite literally, this was her last ditch effort. If this didn't work, if she pushed herself through that crowd, touched this man named Jesus, she wasn't healed. He turned around and got mad at her or he turned around and said, now I'm unclean. What did you do? He couldn't teach. He'd have to go away. That generally would happen. They probably would have jailed her, tortured her or stoned her right there. It was her last ditch effort. But this move she made, this move for reaching out to Jesus, this move moved her from death, a life of death, to life. And she reached out in Jesus in a way that no one in the past ever had. All she did was attempt to touch him. And as you can see from the screen, that's a little bit blurry. This is a scene. There are his prayer beads, his prayer cloth, hanging from the hem of his garment, his cloak, two threads, two hems hanging from it with knots. That's what Jewish people carried. They hung low to the ground by the calf. She dove, reached out, and just barely was able to touch a few of the strands of Jesus' cloak. Now, does that seem like a real respectable way to talk to a preacher? Does that seem like a real respectable way to greet a pastor? If any of you come up and dive at my feet trying to touch my legs or shoes, that would be weird. I don't recommend it. Right? There are acceptable and unacceptable ways to come into God, to approach God, to revere God, to be uh, respectful and fear God. And frankly, everyone's definition of that, this would fall short. That's why it drives me crazy when people don't let kids run around in church or cry or sing. They're children from God. Yes, they're going to cry, sing, and run around. They're not disrespecting God. They're being themselves. They're coming and connecting the way they know how. This woman... In every way, shape, or form, in that society and ours would be disrespecting the church, the men of God, and the leaders. And yet, this was the way she chose to connect with God. And when she connected with him, when she did, she was healed instantly. See, there's no correct way to reach out to Jesus. There's no correct way to do it at church. You don't have to just do it in your pew. You don't have to do it standing up, raising your hands. You don't have to sing the words with all of your power and might. You don't have to sing them quietly. You don't have to sit quietly taking notes while you're listening to the sermon. You don't have to say amen while I'm preaching, although I like it. You don't have to come up to the altar when we say You don't have to stay at home and just watch the videos and repeat them over and over again. There's no correct way to do communion at home or at church. There's no correct way to do uh, Bible studies at home or in church. There's no uh, uh, correct way to reach out to God when you're in college. Well, you have to be part of a Christian group or you have to go to this church here or you have to do this or you have to do that. All you're doing is adding rules. There's no correct way To connect to Jesus in ministry. You don't have to lead a ministry. You don't have to just serve in a ministry. There are lots of different permutations. Lots of different ways the Bible teaches us about connecting with God. Because the bottom line is, right here, the reality is each and every one of us, me and all of you, we are all spiritually dead. And we need to be brought back to life. And that can only happen by connecting with Jesus. Which makes us, by the way, all unclean, just like this woman. And you get desperate enough... And you will want to touch God's presence, just in this case. And any method will do. Any way you choose to reach out to God. I have met so many people over the last seven years as a pastor. As a youth pastor, I talk to kids, teenagers, and young adults. And generally, they reach out to God the same way. They come to the altar. They want me to pray with them. They go to a youth camp. They want me to pray with them. All of a sudden, God does something in their life, and they're super excited. And then they go out and do something stupid, and then they don't come back to church anymore. That experience goes over and over and over again. As a pastor, as a lead pastor, I've met with adults, young adults, uh, adults that are older than me, some that have families, some that don't, and I've heard their stories about how they've connected with God. I've heard the stories about how they've reached out and touched God, and each one is very different, very different. I don't judge. I don't evaluate. I simply encourage you to do so. The Bible says, when we do our baby dedications, that we're not supposed to get in the way of children. They are supposed to come to God in their own way, and we're supposed to encourage it. We're not causing them to stumble. Any method will do. He will respond. You know, when I was a young type uh, in, in, in youth group, uh, I remember one of my first desperate prayers. I was in a fight in a street on, in Baltimore City, on, right on Bel Air Road. I was in a fight. A bunch of people throwing punches. That was... My first, you know, oh my God prayer. Yeah, I said that in church. And I meant it. 
God connected with me right there. Uh, I, I remember um, another time, as I've shared with all of you, in a car accident on the side of the road in Pennsylvania. 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock in the morning, no lights, no fanfare, no publicity. In a car accident, reaching out to God in a very passionate way. There is no right way. And so, I want to brief you really quickly on Pastor Terry. So Pastor Terry comes to Kingsway. Many of you maybe not know him. As I mentioned yes, last week, he was my pastor and still is my pastor. He speaks to me, encourages me, and prays for me. His ministry is a little different than mine, yeah? Um, preaches a little different, prays a little different. He ministers a little different. Um, the first thing I want to say about Pastor Terry's ministry, um, particularly his altar call ministry, when people came up and he prayed for them, um, and he began to minister to them. I want you to hear right now, um, for those of you who, who are open to that type of thing, and those of you who experience that type of thing, and those of you who had an opportunity to be ministered that, maybe you understand, maybe you get it. And for those of you who didn't, maybe you don't understand and you don't get it. I encourage you strongly to think about this woman here. And remind yourself there's no correct way to connect with God. Some people need to connect with God that way. Some people don't want to connect with God that way. Some people come down to connect with God that way and don't connect. Other people come down skeptic and they do connect. There's no right way to reach out to God and connect. There's no correct way of doing it. Some of what you see, you may judge and you may think this and you may think that. But unless you're that person, you have no way to judge what God is doing in their lives. And so I encourage you today that when you see things in God's kingdom, particularly in the year 2023, um, that instead of you saying, well, that doesn't line up with what I think, that's not correct, that's not the right way to do church, that's not the right way to be praying, I hope you remind yourself of this woman here. Because when you're desperate enough, truly desperate enough, you will reach out for his presence in any way you can. Real quick, um, just what Terry was doing there, for those of you who, who are unaware um, Terry was performing a ministry of power at the altar. In the Bible, it talks about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes to bring power to you and me, human beings alike. It's kind of like plugging yourself in, you know, to an electrical cord and getting, you know, a, a, a surge of power. That is what the Holy Spirit can do. The Bible talks about it. In fact, as a Pentecostal, which is you and I and all the people who come to this church, when you read scriptures, we look at it through the lens of Pentecostalism. It simply means that we believe in not just the Father God, not just Jesus Christ, but we believe in the full Trinity, including the Holy Spirit. And there are other denominations that believe in the Holy Spirit. What separates us from maybe them is that we believe the Holy Spirit isn't done doing what the Holy Spirit wants to do. Meaning he's still at work today. What he did in scripture, he's still doing today. And the Bible talks about in Corinthians, the power the Holy Spirit can give to human beings. And it talks about them in the form of gifts, meaning that he will bestow gifts. And some of those gifts you saw on display last week. Three in particular. Four, in fact, now that I think about it. Uh, the Bible talks about the Holy Spirit giving us the power of prophecy or the gift of prophecy. Being able to speak in someone's life about something you do not know and confirming something in their life that they may not know or they may be confused about. Something, in fact, that may not even have happened yet. Not fortune-telling, but prophecy. You also witnessed the gift of wisdom. Pastor Terry sharing wisdom in somebody's life that they needed to hear from Scripture. Uh, that maybe they've heard a thousand times, but hearing it said directly to them is exactly what they needed to hear. The third gift that was operating on Sunday last week was the gift of discernment. Terry is... is is praying for people and able to discern um, a spirit or an oppression or uh, uh, a, um, uh, how would I describe it? Um, um, yeah, a, a spirit in their life um, that needs to um, be corrected, needs to be discerned. Maybe something they were engaging in that they shouldn't or vice versa, something they're engaging in that they should. Discernment is the ability to choose right from wrong and that was on display. And finally, the, the gift of healing. Terry prayed for some for healing, and I, I trust that there will be people who testify that they were healed. That is what you were seeing. And in some cases, like this woman diving out to touch the, the beads, when she was healed, it was miraculous in their life. And in some cases, when people come to the altar and they experience a gift from God, a truly personal gift from God, not in private, but in public, particularly in a church situation, sometimes that will be so real in their life, 
It's hard to even stand up. Some people will literally fall out, the Bible says, under the power of the Holy Spirit. It's in Scripture, and, and some of that you experienced and people saw happening last Sunday. What I wanted to just tell you about that, and I want to move on, is all of it. The power, the prophecy, the healing, the, the wisdom, the discernment, all of it. It's described best, in my view, as thinking about a puzzle. If any of you have ever done a puzzle or like puzzles, right? You take a puzzle and you open the box, you have a bunch of puzzle pieces. And, you know, you, you look for the corners, right? And you put the corners together and then you put the edges together. Once you have the edges together, then you can start putting the middle together. But it becomes very hard to put the middle together if you don't have the what? The box top. You need to know what picture you're putting together. So you take the box top and you sit it right there. And you're like, oh, this piece goes here. And you can begin to put it together. Putting a puzzle together without the right pieces, without the box top, is almost impossible. It's capable, but almost impossible. What you were experiencing, what Terry was doing in that ministry is much like that. He was giving people missing pieces in their ministry, missing pieces in their life. Pieces of wisdom, discernment, knowledge, and healing. And for others, he was giving such wisdom that it was showing them the box top of where they were going and what they were trying to do and helping them discern what's next in their life. That is a powerful, powerful ministry. It's not one that I operate in to that degree. Sometimes the Lord will give me things. Very few times he has done that and I've been able to minister that way. But often I just pray and we let the Lord do his thing. What I encourage you is if you were here at the altar and Terry ministered to you and he said something to you, don't give up. Keep putting your puzzle together. Keep putting the pieces together. Keep putting the corners together. Keep looking at the box top. And if you came to the altar and you didn't get prayed for because you had to leave or time was of the essence or something else came up with your kids or something like that, don't give up. If you're seeking for God, there is no correct way. You do not need to go to Terry to hear from God. You do not need to come to Kingsway to hear from God. However, Terry and Kingsway and Pastor Sean and things like that will help you on your path. To hearing from God. What I want to tell you is don't give up. Yes? Say amen. Amen. See, part of this story here in Scripture and part of what you saw Terry doing is the fact that God was able to meet people with really real problems. God changed a situation that had been a problem for years. This woman had a problem for 12 years, was living a life that was, a, frankly, not worth living. Now, she didn't take her life, but I bet you at times she probably considered that. She was pretty much at the brink of death for 12 years, and yet no one could solve that problem for her. Jesus Christ is capable of solving problems that have been there in your life for years. It's been so long, she probably forgot, failed to remember what real life was like. What real life, happiness, healthiness. She probably forgot what real ministry and serving others was like. And each of us has been there. Each of us, I bet, has had long-standing problems in our lives. Problems that ironically themselves have been killing us. They may be health problems, much like this woman, that have been nagging for year after year after year. They may be addiction problems, problems that we don't tell people about but we know are are real thorns in our side that hold us back, that take a little bit away from us. Relationship problems, maybe friends in your life or family members in your life that continue to be toxic. Or maybe marital problems that you're just not willing to work on or talk about that continue to slowly erode you away year after year after year. Lucky you if you can make it 12 years. This woman did. Or what about problems like feelings? Feelings that you're not exactly sure where they came from, but you know they're there because they're present. Feelings in the morning, noon at night. Feelings that don't line up necessarily with what's going on, but they're there. Feelings of jealousy, anger, unforgiveness. That just are a problem. That you've tried. Maybe you've gone to counseling. Maybe you've self-medicated. Maybe you've tried. They just won't go away. And some of my favorite, <clears throat> what about problems of your mind? Your thoughts. You know, the thoughts that show up when they're not supposed to, the thoughts that, you know, aren't really lining up with what you want to do or think you should do, or thoughts that continue to combat those things in your life that are good, thoughts that come into mind that, you know, don't go to church or don't be with that group or don't be friends with them even though those things are good, 
or maybe thoughts of theologies or philosophies that continue to spin your mind in circles and never get you anywhere. These are all problems, and every single one of them God can help you with. It isn't it interesting? I think it's fascinating that sometimes in order for God to move us into our new life, he has to put a death to some things in our old life. Quite honestly, this story and many others are about you growing into a new part of your life because God is able to kill something in your life right now. So you should ask yourself, what in my life needs to die so that I can get into life? What in my life needs to pass away so I can move to the next level? Do not give up. God is in the business of moving from death to life. Amen? The next thing I saw is sometimes we feel that our problems will keep us from God. So in the, in the chosen story, uh, the disciples stumble upon this woman. It's not here in Scripture, um, but it's in the history books. They stumble upon this woman, and they tell her that Jesus is here. That's how she finds out that Jesus is in the town. And they invite her to come with Jesus. And in this scene here, she says, go away. She comes to the realization once her mind meets the reality, this is a bad idea. Why would I go into public? Why would I go and meet the, the teacher, the prophet, uh, the one who calls himself um, the son of man? Because if I make him unclean, I'll ruin it for everyone else. My problems are bigger than him. My problems are bigger than everyone else. My problems are going to keep me away from God. And sometimes your very problems will be the thing that keep you from God. Your problems are the actual thing that take over your life. Your focus becomes your problem, no longer your solution. So much so, when they stumbled upon her, they said, is she dead? In other words, has our problems gotten us to the point where people around us just think, we're not worth it anymore. We're not worth the advice. We're not worth the effort. If we got to a place in our own lives where we feel like we are just dead. And so she almost didn't go. She was unclean, practically lost all hope. And when she was confronted with hope, she focused only on her fears. It wasn't going to be any different. If I go to Jesus, it's not going to be any different than the other doctors. It might even be worse. You know, they may hurt me. They may ridicule me. What if, what if, what if? That is the soundtrack of fear running through your head. And I'm sure it did with her. It's the way the enemy wants to remind us that we are unholy, we are unworthy, we are unacceptable. That is what Satan wants to teach you. Unholy, unworthy, unacceptable. And God wants to tell you, just come into my presence. But sometimes we need to get desperate. Sometimes we need to get really, really desperate. I find it so interesting. Smaller problems, they tend to hold us back in life. These little nagging things, the things that we can tend to, to you know, um, manage and tolerate in our life, they just hold us back from achieving more, of becoming who we're supposed to be. They just hold us back from being the best version of ourselves. And so smaller problems, you know, we generally don't deal with them, even though those are the ones that are holding us back. But the massive problems, the real serious problems, you know, problems like a brain tumor, problems like losing a spouse, problems like serious health or financial issues, those type of problems, they will thrust us forward in desperation to anything. And so, I remind you this morning, when you are desperate, you fight your way through. This woman fought her way through the crowd, literally, like life and death depended on it. And I want to compare that for a second here. She was in a crowd of people who loved God or believed in God or understood God or at least heard of God and wanted to hear more from God. People that went to church, synagogue, people who read the Bible, people who have maybe been in ministry before, people who've prayed before. She was in a crowd of people like that. And all those people wanted to do was watch Jesus, follow Jesus. Is there anything wrong with that? Following Jesus? Watching Jesus? No. There's nothing wrong with that, but that's what the crowd wanted to do. But her, she wasn't just curious. She wasn't just familiar or wanting to be more familiar with Jesus. She wanted something else, something the crowd didn't want. They just wanted to experience it, but she wanted to change. She wanted her life to be different. 
So instead of just being curious or familiar or just standing by, she pressed through the crowd. You see, when you're truly desperate, you won't just stand around. When you're truly desperate, you will fight for anything. In this case, fight for just a touch, just a mere swipe of his presence. Just a mere swipe of his presence. So today, today, here, are you just present? Do you just come to church to just see what's going on? Do you just come to church to experience worship, to hear the prayers, to hear God's word spoke? Or do you honestly care about reaching out to him? It's why we open the altars. It's why we're doing more of it, giving you an opportunity, whether it's coming down and sitting down here, or whether it's coming to the altar and singing with us, or whether after church is getting prayed for. Any of these ways, including ministry at church, like Josh said, and serving, all of these ways are ways that you can demonstrate to God you mean business. And I got news for you. If you're still listening, you haven't fallen asleep yet, you better hear this one. Oh, there's somebody wake up there. I just told you, and I can show you through scripture, and all the pastors who will share their stories will show you desperate men and women in Bible who, for that reason of desperation, reached out to encounter Jesus, experience death, to experience life. And you better be pretty careful. Because if you come to church, and you're praying that God's going to do something in your life, and you're not desperate enough to touch him, God just may put you in a place of desperation to just see what kind of fight's really in you. I can look around this church, and I see the faces of many, and I can hear and see the stories we've spoke about, about the areas of desperation you've had in your own life, and how that's moved you to a place to fight for your faith. And God has done great things. Amen? Amen. <clears throat> Verse 45, it says, Who touched me? She literally, <laughs> Jesus asked in front of all this crowd. Everyone denied it. And Peter said, Master, this whole crowd is pressing up against you. But Jesus said, Someone deliberately touched me, and I felt healing power go out of me. Why did Jesus do this? Clearly, everyone probably bumped in or touched him. Why did he do this? Church, I want you to hear this point right now before I get to Jairus. I'm building this all up before I get to him. She pressed through, fought through the crowd, pushed on all this men, probably made all these other people unclean by the law, touched Jesus. In fact, by touching Jesus, she made Jesus unclean. So if Jesus was to turn around and say unclean and, 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 and ridicule her and demean her and punish her, but instead he didn't. But she didn't know that. At that moment, she didn't know. So when he asked, who touched me? Nobody wanted to speak up in fear for being ridiculed or worse. But Jesus' intention wasn't to ridicule her. His intention was, I think, threefold. And I want you to hear it real quick. And it's much like when Terry comes to the altar or you come to the altar to get prayed for. One, he wanted to point out that his cloak, the oils, the, 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 the prayer cloths, the oils that we use here, the communion that we serve, in this case his prayer beads or his prayer cloth, they are not magical. We don't sell them. They're not worth hundreds or thousands of dollars. You don't get healed if you give me money. It has no magical or celestial um, or universal power. That power, the magical, the celestial, the universal power, comes from the creator of all of those things. The creator of heaven and earth. The creator of the universe and the cosmos. The creator of the metaverse and all there ever was. That is God incarnate. And he wanted her to know, you touched my hem and you think the hem made you healed. That is incorrect. Me, God of the universe, is what healed you. So when you come out and get prayed for, it's not me or Terry, it's God. And in that case, a lot of times in public, we'll talk about the prayers, and he'll say things, and I'll say things in public where people can hear. Why? So the crowds can hear that which God is doing. So you can be taught, and you can testify. And finally, and this is important, Jesus said, instead of ridiculing her, he says, and this is important, daughter. Daughter. Well, it says your faith has made you well, and I can preach that, but I just want to stick on the daughter. It didn't occur to me until I watched The Chosen. It didn't occur to me why he said this, daughter. You know, it's not like all from through Scripture he said son a lot, um, but he said daughter to this particular person. Why did he do that? And this is very important. It's why a lot of people come to the altar. It's why Terry has a following of people that come to the altar to listen to him. Um, this is the reason why. This woman here, and if you watch the show, it's great. You realize that she lost everything, including her home, her money, her finances, and her family, including her own parents. 
more than likely disowned her. That was commonplace in the culture. You are no longer my daughter. I have no father. I have no family. I have no origin. I have no lineage. I am worthless. It's how she left and led the last 12 years of her life. And for the first time in 12 years after she came in contact with God, somebody looked at her and called her daughter. The very thing she needed to hear. And so when you come up and get prayed for, often is the case, God will share through his scripture or through a man or woman of God, the very thing you need to hear. Amen? Amen. I want to say this too. At times, there's real pressure not to rely on Jesus. So real quick here, when we turn our attention to real life death, Jairus, he was a synagogue ruler and his daughter was dying. That means G Jairus was part of the problem, not the solution. He was part of the leaders at the time who were trying to kill Jesus, trying to hurt Jesus. He was a major leader in that um, organization. And his daughter was dying, so he became desperate. So he wanted to fight for his daughter, so he wanted to come find Jesus and see if that would help her. The problem is everyone around him told him not to do it. No matter what, some people refuse to lean on God, even in death. Go to any hospital in America. There are dying people. I've been praying for lots of people. Sometimes I'll go to the hospital to pray for one of you. And on my way in or way, way out, I'll offer to pray for somebody else. And they will tell me, no. Don't turn away from the one person who can actually help you. I think... When the pressure is on to turn away from God, we must have a planned reaction. There are times in your life where things, you will get pressure from family, pressure from society, pressure from medical organizations, pressure from the TV, if that's even a thing anymore, your streaming service, pressure from content to not rely on God, pressure from worldly wisdom, pressure from conventional wisdom to not rely on God, pressure from your own thoughts to not rely on God. I got this. I can do this. I don't need to pray. I got it under control. If I just do this. God is saying, rely on me and I will take you from death to life. And when you have that pressure, you better have a plan. You better know, well, do you worship? Do you go to your prayer closet? Do you call your pastor? What do you do? Because more than likely, if you handle it yourself, you'll find yourself with more death and not life. I encourage you to come up with a plan. Worship, church, prayer closet, call the pastor. Or what I like to do, you want to know what I do in the last two months? When I'm having real struggles with my faith, I turn on the chosen does it for me every time. Jesus can make a difference when it seems too late. You see, Jairus' daughter was dying. And it's easy to get mad when things seem too late. You see, right after this, he says, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. He healed somebody who's been dealing with a problem for 12 years. That means he stopped. He got touched. He turned around. He dealt with that whole situation, moved the crowd out, had a conversation with this woman. He was very intentional about this woman. And in that time that he spent, he was no longer rushing and hurrying to Jairus' house. And in that time, because he wasn't rushing and hurrying, in verse 49, it says, While Jesus was still speaking to this woman, a messenger arrived at the home of Jairus, the leader of the synagogue. He told Jairus, Your daughter is dead. There's no use troubling the teacher now, troubling Jesus now. <laughs> it took me um, to be a father to understand this. Um, of course, I understood the daughter was dead. And as a father, I can't imagine what I would be feeling as a father. I'd be so mad at Jesus. Why couldn't you just come to my house first? Why couldn't you just, why couldn't you just pray for my daughter first? Why did you have to, she's been dealing for 12 years. You could have came to my house, she could have dealt with it for 12 more minutes. Then you could heal my daughter, then you could have came back there. That's what Americans think. That's what a logical, educated human being would think. God, that's how you should do things. That's not how God works. And then the logical human being is now mad at God. My daughter died because you were off doing something you thought was more important. By the way, that's what God does. And you get mad. And I, I, and, and I really understood that as a father, being a father, getting mad at God because my daughter would have died. But it wasn't until I had children and experienced my children that I realized it. I have children at all ages, from the little ones, toddlers, all the way up to young adults. And I have learned this. Ask your kids anything about a life situation that they're upset about. And pretty much every situation, they will tell you, it's too late. It's over. It's never going to get better. You didn't do it fast enough. That's not what I want. It's not right, Dad. 
My daughter told me high school was over before the ninth grade even started. Life was over. Not even the first day of class to even meet her friends. It's over, she told me. I've had conversations with my sons last night. Dad, it's too late. We should have did this. We should have did that. You don't understand, Dad. If you were involved, it would have been different. That's what we say to God all the time. If you were involved, it would have been different. And unlike me, God is up there. He's like, I am involved. All things work together for good. Let me do my thing, son. It's never too late. In fact, said differently, it's too late for everyone else except for God. And the daughter was, in fact, dead. And in 49, it says, while he was speaking with her, a messenger arrived. And then when Jesus heard what had happened, he said to Jairus, and this is awesome. I know I'm going a little late and I was supposed to go early, but I can't help myself. Don't be afraid, just have faith. Don't be afraid. Now we're back to the faith series. Faith again. Faith in church, is it making a difference in your life? Well, it depends. Are you reaching out or are you just curious? Faith in worship, to really move your spirit, encourage you. Is it working? Is it helping? Well, it depends. Are you engaging? Are you intentional? Or are you just witnessing and observing? The Bible, faith in the Bible? Are you scared of it? Too many big words, not enough versions, too many versions. You don't like what it says here. You don't like that verse there in the Old Testament. You don't like this verse because it tells you not to do that. I don't know. Faith in the altar service. Ooh, I don't want nobody touching me. Too close. I don't want to fall down. You know, big, oh, by the way, one that gifts the spirit of speaking in tongues. Oh, I don't want to hear that. That's crazy talk. Um, I don't know. Faith, what about just in God or Jesus himself? Is Jesus the son of man? Do you believe that? God is saying you will not have it all figured out. In fact, at the precipice of figuring out, you more than likely will be scared. Put your faith in front of your fear. I, I, it's an awesome quote. It's a modern quote from a, a famous speaker. He says this. It's not necessarily biblical, but you know everything that's not biblical isn't sinful. So I want to read this quote to you. Fears that you don't face become your limits. It's a beautiful quote. And I think it lines up with many things I see even right here. If he faced the fear of saying, Jesus, you don't understand. I am afraid. My daughter's dead. Just go away. He would have never experienced the miracle that comes next. And it would become his limit. God can do everything but raise people from the dead. But Jairus, just like many others, did not have a limit on God. And said, my fear will not limit me. And Jesus, do your thing despite how scared I am. Again, here we are with the parody of life and death and death and life. That in order to bring forth new life, life that we've been praying for, life that we want so badly, life that we've probably been dreaming about, to bring forth that life, that requires death to other things in our current life. The question is, are we too afraid to let that stuff die? Are we too afraid to let Jesus do his thing? When he arrived at the house, Jesus wouldn't let anyone go in except Peter, James, and John and the little girl's mother and father. The house was filled with people weeping and wailing. He said, stop weeping. She isn't dead. This wasn't just family. This was actually in Jewish culture. You had to pay people to mourn, to cry with you. They did that. But the crowd laughed at him. This is where I'm coming to an ending. The worship team can help me. The world still laughs at Christ. They laughed at Jesus. Jesus came in to heal a daughter who was sick who was now dead and they laughed at him they laughed at the son of man they laughed at jesus the christ the messiah they laughed at him they laughed at what he said they laughed at what he wanted to do they laughed at him they will laugh at your faith they will laugh at your belief system they will laugh at your story whatever it is if it includes christ they will laugh at your lifestyle Whatever lifestyle you choose to live because you're following Christ. They will laugh at your decisions, including reaching out to just touch the hem of his garment. They laughed at him. The unbeliever does not see what God sees. God said she was sleeping. Yeah, people laughed at me all the time in 
my work scenarios or investment scenarios when they hear I'm a pastor and they hear, you know, what I do, where I spend my time. Well, if you spent your time doing this, you can make so much more money. If you spent your time doing that, you can do this, you can do that. That's crazy. They laugh at it. You know what they don't laugh at? They don't laugh at my marriage. They don't laugh at my success that I have had in business. And they don't laugh at the outcomes of my life. Why? Because those are all things people can see. Those are the things that people want to judge other people based on. But those things are in my life because not of my own doing, but because I lean on the Lord. They're in my life because it's not my way, it's His way. It's the way of the Bible. I'm simply following it. And it's that which they want to laugh at. So they will not have those outcomes until they try it His way. I lean on things for which I cannot see. She was sleeping, he said, which was actually very true. You know, the Bible calls our death a sleep. It says that if you give your heart to Christ, that when you die, you in fact fall into a sleep or a slumber in him. So in one real, you know, he's not a man he should lie. It always occurred to me, did he just lie to everyone? Like right here. I mean, she's really dead. Her pulse ain't beating, right? She's not breathing. In fact, she didn't start breathing again until he got up and touched her. So medically speaking, was she dead? I don't know. So he must have meant something when he said she was just sleeping, much like he did with Lazarus. I have a verse for you. You want to see it? Jesus. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13. Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who, what? sleep in death so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope meaning that when you die or death is coming upon your life that you believe that there is not death to life that death is the end in king james it doesn't even say sleep in death it just says those who are in deep sleep it says in verse 14 the following verse in first thessalonians for we believe that jesus died and rose again and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in Him. Jesus is in the business of bringing death to life. Even in the ultimate calculation, when you breathe your last breath here on earth, if you are breathing it in Him, you will fall into a sleep to which He will carry you forward to the day He returns and He will bring you with Him out of your sleep. The next four weeks we'll focus on Bible stories that should remind everybody of what God can do. Each story is a different walk of life. Each story is a different circumstance, a different situation. Maybe something you can relate to. What I wanted to say finally, just to end here, maybe you can stand with me. Jesus. <clears throat> you know, I was sick all week, barely having the energy to study. My voice was gone the last couple days, scratchy. And, and it occurred to me, well, if I don't come out and preach, what are we going to do Sunday? What are you guys going to come to? I'm sure we get another pastor or something here. But it reminded me of something Terry said when he gave his um, prophecy to the whole church, if you were able to hear that. Kingsway, this church right here, you, me, all of us, what we stand for right now, we are certainly not dead. Some history of Kingsway, some of the ministries of Kingsway, some of the old ideas of Kingsway. Maybe they died. Maybe they should have. But KCC, Kingsway Christian Center, today is 100% alive. Terry gave us a prophecy that said Kingsway is about to go into a, a new generation of its own growth. I received that. There are more men and women investing their time, their energy into Kingsway in 2023 than ever in the history of Kingsway. You may not see it. And I'm not talking about for money or prestige or position or career. For no other reason than to grow the kingdom of God in Rosedale and the schools and the community service around this area. For our children, for generation after generation. In order for that to happen, you must move from death to life. You must get into your ministry, into your soul. You must get in deep and realize that God is reaching out his hand, just like he did to Jairus' daughter. 
Your ministry may be dead. Your finances may be dead. Your marriage may be dead. Your friendships may be dead. Your health situation may be on the brink of death. Your, your, your spiritual journey may have come to a dead end. And Jesus Christ says, don't laugh at that. Don't let the world laugh at you. Don't think for a second it's over. Hey, I'm going to reach my hand down to you. And if you're as intentional as I am, I will tell you to get up, my child. That's who you are. You are God's child. Your sons and daughters, the one true living God. And he says to you this morning, get up. Get up out of your bed. Get up out of your stinking life and live the one that he's created for you. Get up out of worship and really worship. Get up and really pray. Get up and really serve him and watch what God can do. Are you with me, church? If yes, say amen. I want to pray with you right now. I want to dismiss you. And I want to open the altars. If anyone didn't get prayed for last week and wants to get prayed for today, we will be here to pray with you. If anybody needs prayer this week, we are here to pray for you. But with that, let me bless you. Heavenly Father, Lord God, you are the Alpha and the Omega. You are the beginning and the end. You are the master of the universe, Lord God. You can do all things and all things are subject to you. Father, we humble ourselves before the father of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We humble ourselves, Father God, before the God of Israel and the God of this land. We seek your face and we turn from our ways, our wicked ways, our ways of fear, that limit us, our ways of logic that you, Lord, laugh at. And we turn our ways to your ways and your thoughts, to your scripture, where you teach us that you must kill things in our life, that they must be dead in order to be brought back to new life. Father, I pray that you would move in the hearts and minds and the souls and spirits of whosoever in the sound of my voice. I pray, Lord, that you would bless them and keep them. I pray that your presence would move in their lives, that you would reach down your hand and say, no matter what you've done, no matter what's in your past, no matter what's in your history, I'm reaching out my hand, and I'm asking you to get up, my child. And I pray, Lord, they take your hand, and that your face would go with them as they come and they go. And I pray they would learn to know your peace, your mercy. In the precious and holy name of Jesus Christ, the whole Kingsway Church says, Amen. You are blessed. Now go be a blessing.